Beverly, whenever you are ready, please begin. How okay. okay. My name is Beverly. My mother was Christina Marshall and my grandmother was Bessie Two Bears. I come from the Lakota band of Hong Papa who were sitting both people. I now live here in Vermont and I intend to make Vermont my home until the day I take my last breath. I was asked to come today and to welcome you all. And I regret that I'm not able to be there in person, but I am hoping that a dear friend of mine who is Ashanabe is there. I asked her to walk around the room and burn some sage to smudge. We use sage as a way to ward off any negativity that might come in our direction and to send it back from where it came. We also use it when we pray. And today I would like to offer a prayer to Tunkashila that the subject being discussed be received with open hearts, open minds, open ears. And those Tunkashila who find that the words resonate in their lives might recognize who they are and be able to shed any dishonesty that they might live with. I pray Kankashira that the ancestors from all our four directions might gather, might gather to add to the words that are being spoken today and that those generations to come who depend upon us to ensure that our cultures remain intact, that our theospe, our families, our communities continue to grow strong, might come and sit beside us and share their wisdom with each and every participant who is sitting in this room. I ask that creator, you help those that are speaking to speak with truth from their hearts and from a clear mind. And I ask Sankashila that those who might be offended would stop and look within themselves. Help each of us to look within ourselves and see who we are and how we hope to present in this world. But most of all, I pray for those children, those children who are yet to be born, those children who surround us now, today, and I ask them, Kashla, that you give us the wisdom and the courage to say the things we need to say. <coughs> I'm sorry. Hey, I'm a duck, we have to say. I thank you all for being here. And now I'd like to turn it over to our host and ask that all of you listen very carefully with open hearts and open minds. Good afternoon to all of you. My name is Dave Massell. I'm a professor of history at UVM and I am among the faculty co-organizers of this event. We are grateful for the support of the Center for Research on Vermont, the Environmental Studies Program, the Canadian Studies Program, as well as Middlebury College's Department of Anthropology, Department of French and Francophone Studies. We are grateful to UVM staff for their skillful support, including Dana Umble, Devin James, 
Ben Lawrence, Shari Dyke, Andy Tagliamonte, and Andrea Rosenkrantz. Our panel today engages a challenging issue. The question of indigenous identity in the Northeast on both sides of the Canadian-American border. As Vermonters, we are particularly concerned with how this plays out in the Green Mountain State, where many residents have come to believe they are indigenous people, Abenaki, and where others, often in positions of influence and seeking to do right, have built relationships with these individuals and passed state recognition laws that will be discussed this evening. Our panel concerns indigenous people themselves, including the sovereign nations of both the Mi'kmaq and the Abenaki. In Eastern Canada and into Maine, the Mi'kmaq have found themselves struggling with so-called Acadian Métis, who claim rights promised long ago to the Mi'kmaq people in treaties dating back to 1726. Here in Vermont, the Abenaki were displaced northward across the international border by 1800, but are still alive and present, including a delegation from Odenak First Nation in this room and it is on unceded Abenaki territory that we hold this conversation today. It was also in this building two years ago that the Abenaki shared their history and denounced the process by which the government of Vermont recognized groups of people as them, as Abenaki citizens, as their kin, without their consent. Our panel also touches university life. I am a member of the history faculty. My research and my courses explore Canadian American history, environmental history, and native newcomer relations. My role, my job, is to explore the historical record with my students and my colleagues, including, including colleagues beyond UVM, regardless of what facts and truths we find there, regardless of how inconvenient or unsettling those discoveries may be. The main purpose of a university, UVM's policy on academic freedom reads, has always been, must always be, to stimulate the thinking and the creative powers of its students and its faculty. As an institution, it deals in ideas, not only old and accepted ones, but new ones that may be full of explosive power. If they are explosive, they are bound to be disconcerting even painful to some on the campus and to many beyond its borders. Academic freedom is therefore not solely a right or privilege of the faculty, but is the fulfillment of the obligation on the part of the university to provide an atmosphere in which intellectual growth may take place." End quote. Finally, University administration is recommended I read from the policy called free expression campus speakers response to disruption as follows quote UVM respects and values free expression including the lawful expression of dissent dissent is welcome so long as it does not interfere with the ability of the speaker to deliver the message or the ability of the audience to receive the speaker's message an individual whose actions interfere in this manner will be warned. If the individual or group continues to intervene, they will be escorted out and will be held accountable under relevant university policies. Our goal 
is to have a peaceful and respectful event. We appreciate your cooperation, end quote. Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce Gordon Henry, who will moderate our panel this afternoon. He is Professor Emeritus of English, as well as American Indian and Indigenous Studies at Michigan State University, where he held the Leslie Endowed Chair. Congratulations on your retirement. He is also the convener of the International Forum Unsettling Genealogies, which has been ongoing since 2022. Gordon is an enrolled citizen of the White Earth Anishinaabe Nation of Minnesota. He is a poet and a novelist, and his 1995 book, The Light People, received the American Book Award. Gordon will introduce our panelists, Pam Pometer and Daryl LaRue, each of whom will speak for roughly 25 minutes. We'll use the second hour to take questions. Thanks to those who used the registration form to pose questions in advance. You may also write a question on the index card found on your chair and students will gather these. Our several hundred remote attendees may post a question online where students are receiving them here. Thank you, Evelyn and Ethan. So students, faculty, staff, members of the public, please join me in providing a chilly spring day but warm Green Mountain welcome to a distinguished panel of scholars who will speak to indigenous belonging and rights in the Northeast. Indigenous cause gate take a new men on Gordon Henry, Anishinaabe and Dao, Makwadotam Dao, Gawaba Baganakak and Donjiba, Nui Gikado, Jaganashamoan, Anongum. Good afternoon, everyone. Pretendians, race shifters, ethnic frauds, pseudo Indians are not new to me or any other native who has worked in tribal communities, academia, or a host of other sites of public presentation and representations of tribal people. Pretendians have been around for longer than I've been living, though at this moment in my personal history and the history of sovereign tribes, these settler North American race shifting pretendian frauds have proven more pervasive, more aggressive, more demanding than ever. And whereas historically early on, the harms produced by pretending stem mostly from individual frauds. More recently, in late 20th century, early 21st century, we as Native people have witnessed a troubling proliferation of state and provincial sanction of fake tribes. In 2011, Circe, Circe Storm offered this, quote, people with dubious claims to being indigenous are increasingly being accepted as such by colonial institutions. They are race shifters, end quote. In a guest opinion article from Native News Online from November 15, 2023, Eastern Band Cherokee Principal Chief Michelle Hicks and Shawnee Chief Ben Barnes wrote, quote, there are now hundreds of groups that falsely claim to be tribes. Some of them base their claims on state recognition processes that have proven themselves to be inadequate to verify even minimal claims to be a tribe. Pretendians and their consortiums of fake tribes forge false native belonging by playing on settler colonial guilt, ignorance, and settler desire for remedial justice. The pretendian and their settler playing Indian colonial state sanctioned status as natives operates as more than just another example of playing Indian. It is, a, it is better understood as display. Self-created natives as a symptom of their own settler disease with a settler past and as a clear sign of how settler colonial claims to native life, bodies, and sovereignty underscores, quote, lingering anxieties over settler legitimacy and belonging, end quote. It is a claim to innocence that perpetuates violent settler, settler colonial attempts to displace legitimate tribal communities and peoples. 
the fraudulent pretendian claims to innocence, the not denial of their own settler identities, histories, and genealogies must be defended by them for their fraud to remain viable. Invariably, that leads to the kinds of attacks I've seen, we've seen, on tribal people who call them out on their false claims. Those attacks are, as my friend Ellen Cushman put it, Darvo constructions, as the pretendians deny evidence, attack natives, reverse Indian and settler, so the settler seemingly becomes victim and the legit native the oppressor. All of us who have tried to address the issue of indigenous ethnic fraud have experienced some kinds of these attacks, often through social media, at other times, as in my experiences in the academy, through conversations behind closed doors, where pretending access to institutional policy makers creates a hostile environment for native people. Yet the personal attacks are just a sliver of the harms pretendians and race shifters bring about in their vain attempts to be native. In 2019, in a 2019 volume of the American Indian Culture and Research Journal, in the introduction titled Fraud in Native American Communities, Nancy Marie Mitlow wrote, quote, what interests, are, what interests are at work when arts organizations accepting public funds refer, reserved for American Indian peoples persist in promoting factual untruths about an artist's Native identity? What causes are buoyed when the U.S. court system and legislative bodies, I would add, without clear evidence, allow groups of individuals to self-identify as newly formed Native communities. As these articles attest, clear harms are wrought on American Indian personhood and nationhood when egregious claims are enacted and supported by institutions that are sworn to uphold ethics and laws, such as marine museums and courts, and I would add again legislative bodies, as these harms mirror benefits afforded by false claims of Native identity." End quote. Mithlow further adds, quote, belonging may be one of the last resources that American Indian communities can actually protect, and I'd say First Nations as well. This protection, however, requires careful and consistent vigilance working from Native-centric viewpoints and in ideologies, not reactive, stunted, or covert portrayals defined by non-Native perspectives. Enough said. I could go on, of course. And, and talk about much more, but uh, an unusual turn of events. I've only been given five minutes. I hope, I hope, and I, I hope I haven't gone over. Uh, I do want to thank Dave and the administration here, and also the Abnaki people of Odenak and Wolinak for their unwavering strength as they spoke at the uh, UN recently. And I'm, I have to ha give a shout out also uh, to Susie, Rick, Daniel, and Jacques. I learned a lot in the classroom this morning listening to you. And I must reach out to my friends who've been working with me on this issue for uh, over 10 years. Jacqueline Keeler, Kim Tallbear, Trevino Brings Plenty, Kathy White, Joe Candillo, and the Tribal Alliance Against Fraud. Thank you all for your important work and for your courage and uh, willingness to speak out. So we have two speakers to follow, and I'm really honored to introduce both of them. Pound Palmetter's work explores indigenous sovereignty and rights, including the right to determine citizenship a professor and the chair in Indigenous Governance at Toronto Metropolitan University. She is also a citizen of the Eel River Bar First Nation in New Brunswick, a podcaster and the author of three books, including Beyond Blood, Rethinking Indigenous Identity. Her website tells us Pam Palmer is an unwavering defender of Indigenous rights and social justice who inspires people all over the world to embrace their roles as allies, supporters, and partners in leading social change. She leaves her audiences with a passion to ignite their minds through education so they can empower themselves and others to transform society. By working together, we can feel social change and positively impact future generations. Many organizations have also benefited from PAN's advice, strategies, and professional training. A beacon of hope and catalyst for change, PAM envisions a future of healthy, safe, and empowered communities leaving an indelible mark on indigenous reconciliation and social progress. Daryl LaRue, our second speaker, is an associate professor at the University of Ottawa and the author of a 2019 book, Distorted Descent, White Claims to Indigenous Identity, from the University of Manitoba Press. 
His research on Eastern Métis, Labrador Métis, Métis Nation of Ontario, and the four state-recognized Abnaki tribes of Vermont has earned him a reputation as a leading scholar of self-indigenizing or race shifting in the Northeast. Since 2015, Dr. LaRue has been studying the changing dynamics of white French descendant identities in the 21st century, particularly as it pertains to increasing claims to indigenous identities among this group. His book, Distorted White Descent, Distorted Descent, sorry, <laughs> White Claims to Indigenous Identity, was selected as one of the 10 most influential books published by the University of Manitoba Press in the past decade. His research continues to push the boundaries in the study of white identities, and as such, he is widely sought after as a public speaker on matters related to contemporary forms of settler colonialism. I'll turn it over to Pam now. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Making sure you can hear me okay? Yes. yes? Oh, oh, awesome. Okay, thank you. Kwe Nindaluizi Pampometer. I'm from the Sovereign Mi'kmaq Nation, an unceded Mi'kma'ki. And it's an honor to be a part of this because it just is reminiscent of our age old Wabanaki Confederacy long before settlers came. You know, we had Mi'kmaq and Wollastoque, Penobscot, Abenaki, Aroostook, like. Uh, so many of the Eastern tribes and nations came together to trade with one another, have families with one another, protect our territories from invaders. And I feel like we're kind of doing that now. We need this confederacy. We need everybody coming together to really push back this threat because it's a threat, not just a you know, a political annoyance. It's literally a threat to our sovereignty, our nationhood, citizenship, our very culture, uh, and I and I would argue our legal rights and and political standing in the future, whether you're in what's now known as Canada or the United States. So I feel very, very passionately about this topic, and I'm very honored that you're giving me um, some time to to talk about at least what my experience is uh, on the East Coast in uh, as part of the Mi'kmaq Nation. Um, I am going to share my screen. Hopefully it works. Let's just see. Share. Is it sharing? Yeah? Oh, right. Okay, great. I always mess it up when I'm teaching class. Um, and this is a medallion, by the way. Uh, it's a Mi'kmaq quill work that um, this amazing person uh, made for me. And it has sweet grass and it's got our eight pointed star, which is really symbolic of who we, who we are as Mi'kmaq people. And I think that's where I wanna start because we often start with the problem uh, and all of the ways in which our identity has been colonized or co-opted or appropriated, as opposed to really thinking about, well, you know, who are we? And so when people ask me that question, who are the Mi'kmaq? Well, to me, the first thing I think of uh, is our is our language, because that's how we're communicating sometimes with sign language. It's about Mi'kma'ki. And for those who don't know what Mi'kma'ki means, it's basically Mi'kmaq territory. So it's our connection, our roots to our territory. It's our nationhood, peoplehood. I know we're having this conversation in English, so there's no one good word to use, but I think you know what I mean in terms of self-governing nation, nation, peoplehood, uh, whatever term you want to use. Um, the fact that we are taking back our traditional names. So Ugbaganjig is the Mi'kmaq name for my First Nation, Eel River Bar First Nation, that I am a, a member of. And when I have this conversation, wherever, whatever reserve I go to, whether it's with the tribes in the US or any of the First Nations across Canada, the first question out of their mouth is always, well, who are you? Where do you come from? And who's your parents? <laughs> I mean, literally, you don't even get in the door or get to sip your tea. And it's, where do you come from? Who are you? And who are your parents? And that's something that's just generally a part of our tradition, something that I really love. 
And so I would start with, well, I come from a long line of ancestors, obviously, but the closest ones to me would be Louis Jerome. He was one of the last traditional leaders uh, in our territory, and he had to travel all the seven districts of Mi'kmaq to maintain relations. Um, and my grandmother, Margaret Jerome, who was a traditional healer, she was so good at healing that she had a better success rate than the local doctor did on the settler population. So, you know, win for her. Uh, and then my father, who was a self-taught electrician and a disabled World War II veteran who went to war not to fight for the right to vote, which is a big misunderstanding, but because the Mi'kmaq signed treaties and we had an obligation in uh, public safety and national security. And so he was living out that obligation under the treaty, even though settler governments were not living up to their end. I have eight sisters and four brothers. I have two sons and one grandson, Sibu which means river in English. And I'm just so happy. He's just made everything about my life perfect. Uh, in terms of Mi'kmaq, for anyone who has not been to Mi'kmaq, when you think of, it's mostly in Canada, but Mi'kmaq territory encompasses all of the province of Nova Scotia, all of Prince Edward Island, a large portion of the province of New Brunswick, Parts of Newfoundland, I wouldn't say the majority for sure, parts of Newfoundland, uh, we have Mi'kmaq communities in Quebec and also in Maine. So we're, I guess you would call us a cross-border tribe or <laughs> a border tribe, however, however you call it. But we were broken up into seven different districts, like long before contact. And that's a part of of who we are, like maintaining those relationships, maintaining our traditional government, maintaining our travel, and trying to maintain our political relationships, like the one with the Wabanaki Confederacy. <sighs> and for all of those, you know, the online trolls and stuff who say, well, you came over the Bering Strait, so you can't possibly have any claims to autonomy. First of all, even if that was true, uh, we we're here first and governing here for, you know, thousands and thousands of years. But second of all, we know it's not true. And we have been here since time immemorial. So well over 100,000 years. We know this because the uh, new science has proven that we were both an oral and a written language nation. And I think that's important because, again, a lot of stereotypes and myth being promoted by fake Indians and pretendians, you know, about only being an oral um, nation. We weren't. And these are some of the petroglyphs where we were trying to tell stories, our traditional stories, our creation stories, um, what we were doing, how we were engaged in providing for our nation, obviously, um, Symbols of what it meant to be a Mi'kmaq woman, a Mi'kmaq man, a child, our relations. We already talked about the eight-pointed star. So all of this, to me, all comes first before we have this conversation about pretendians. Because Mi'kmaq, they are a government. They have their own laws, their own leaders. We have our own warriors, then and now. Life givers, obviously. We have very important political relationships and we seem to be reinvigorating them lately on a large number of issues. We have treaties that never interfered with our sovereign rights. Uh, like I said, the confederacies and like any other nation, we had our own economies and, and trade and travel and our own knowledge systems and not just where to hunt and fish, which was life and death but also science and biology and engineering and medical knowledge. I mean, uh, in general, the medical knowledge of indigenous peoples in North and South America were far advanced to those of the European settlers coming over. I mean, when we have a better success rate at brain surgery than they do, I'm thinking, you know, we've got to start rewriting these history books because we're pretty awesome. Um, but most of all, it's about land and it's about our kin, our living relationships. It's, 
it's always relationships. And one of the things I, I totally agree with Kim, Dr. Kim Tallbear. She says, all of these pretendians are focused on identity, individual, me, me, me. What do I get? I'm this, I'm that. With complete disregard for nationhood. And in, and in fact, you're part of a nation. You're part of a collective. There's relationships. There's kin. And if you're only talking about yourself, well, that's a red flag, as they say. Along comes treaties. And there's a lot more than just these ones here, but they, I, I listed those because they are pre-Confederation treaties. So before Canada was even Canada, we were signing treaties and our treaties have no end date. They're for our heirs and our heirs forever. And there was nothing in the treaties where we gave up our sovereignty. There's nothing that even purports to give up our land and certainly no um, giving up control of who our citizens were. And I think that's that's really important to remember. After treaties, we now have settlement. And I guess like in the East Coast, we've had we've been bombarded with colonization the longest. It's like 500 years. So people on the West Coast, not as long. So we've had 500 years to see what developed and what didn't in our territories. And basically the way it worked was if you were part of a mixed parentage, say a fur trader, for example, uh, and a Mi'kmaq person, they were either Mi'kmaq or they were white. And I'm using that word because that's the word that's used in the history books. You can say European, some of the more Acadians, but it was Mi'kmaq or white. There was no other community. There was no other sovereign nation. There was no other historic development of a community like the Métis Nation in the Western provinces of Canada. It was Mi'kmaq or white. And it just went down that line. And that's not good, bad, or indifferent. That's just the way our nations were. And in fact, contrary to popular belief, I mean, we hear a lot of these stereotypes around, oh, everybody has Mi'kmaq ancestry. No, we don't. That's just the myth that they perpetuate. It's kind of like when you go to the United States and everybody's Cherokee. We know, no, they're not. But this is part of the myth that helps perpetuate these pretendians. And so uh, I'm just going to talk about a couple of these because there are just so many. And for me, while we need to call out the individuals, I'm very concerned about these groups, like groups of pretendians pretending to be nations or tribes or some kind of historic community. So we have Joseph Boyden, someone that I had never, ever, ever heard of, uh, talking about indigenous reconciliation in the media not making any sense. None of us were agreeing with him. And we all kind of had, you know, red flags up. When we started looking into it, you see over time, first he's identifying as Nipmuc, um, and then Ojibwe, and then no, all of a sudden he's Métis. Oh, no, no, wait. Now he's Mi'kmaq. I feel like Mi'kmaq and Métis are the catch-alls in, in Canada. He was called out, thank goodness. Uh, he was one of the early ones in Canada. And because of that, you had some high profile native people, sometimes called defendians, people who defend pretendians, defendians, uh, defending him because he writes so well, or he gives great speeches, or I'm really good friends with him. And those are all great reasons to be friends with him or not. But it has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not he's a citizen of any of those nations uh, and whether or not he alone has the right to crash through our sovereignty and just make those assertions for himself. And he doesn't. And he's not here anymore. I believe he's overseas working on an autobiography. I think it's called Oh Poor Me, but I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so then we have Vianne Timmons. Vianne Timmons is a woman who was the head, the president of Memorial University in Newfoundland. Imagine when we're talking about pretendians, we're not just talking about some people, you know, going to powwows and acting weird. We're talking about people in positions of power. They're decision makers. They can determine our future or not legally, politically, academically. What I like about this scenario was as soon as she was called out for being a fake, the university took action and that hasn't been the trend in Canada. So her indigenous claims 
have kind of shifted a little bit. So she was always claiming to be Mi'kmaq. And she went and got a membership in a fake, unrecognized, this is not a Métis or a Mi'kmaq nation, but they call themselves the Brador Mi'kmaq First Nation. They're not a First Nation and they're certainly not recognized, but she bought a membership uh, in them. She had the audacity to go to the Inspire Awards and accept an award. Like, award. Can you imagine as, as taking an award away from an Indigenous person and accepting it? Uh, and then she tried to backpedal a little bit and she said, well, no, you know, maybe it's just mm, Mi'kmaq heritage that I have. And then she backpedaled again. It's like, well, no, I've never identified as Mi'kmaq. I kind of have Indigenous heritage. My identity is Indigenous. And it's like, the, there's no such identity as Indigenous. Like, there just isn't. You're Métis, you're Inuit, uh, Alaska Native, you're from one of the tribes. Anyway. Uh, the university got rid of her, and we were very, very, very thankful for that because we only had to dig just this tiny little bit in social media to find where she's made all of these claims before. And I'm sure getting her position was helped in part by claiming to be Mi'kmaq. And then we have Elizabeth Hoover. I'm sure many of you know her. She's from the States. The reason why I'm raising her is because all of these really high-profile pretendians always seem to have Mi'kmaq as one of their identities. And it's very, very, very frustrating. So she made multiple different claims. She claimed to be Mi'kmaq. She claimed to be Mohawk. And then her identity shifted to, like, just indigenous, which, again, there's no such thing. She's one of the rare few who've now come out and apologized and said, I'm a white woman. I never should have appropriated this identity. Obviously, lots of damage done, but she's one of the rare few who don't just dig in their heels. So lots of individuals, I think we need to call them out. My big, 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 big concern are groups um, of, basically groups of individuals who are claiming to be Mi'kmaq or Métis or some combination of those in our sovereign Mi'kmaq territory. That's my biggest concern. So you've got the Acadian Métis who have literally just exploded. And if you read Dr. Darrell's book, uh, Distorted Distent, you'll learn all about them. But they've been rejected by Acadians, they've been rejected by the Mi'kmaq, they've been rejected by the Métis Nation itself, and they're not recognized. Thankfully, uh, they are losing, I think, the majority of their court cases, if not all so far, uh, in trying to assert rights as Acadian Métis. But here's the thing, and one of the reasons why they're so dangerous, is they've weaponized their identity. They've asserted that they're unassailable. You can't question any person or group's identity. That would be thinking like a colonizer. Um, I've had them on social media saying, you're just trying to commit genocide against us. And I was like, you don't even exist. Or the lateral violence. Um, there's just so many things, you know, again, red flags, pretendians. But it's very, very concerning because despite their rejection by the entire world, they're still going ahead with court cases. They're still filing complaints against people like me and others who have spoken out against these people. They're trying to take our jobs. They're publishing really, really, really fast. They're doing books. They're basically trying to pad the legal file. And again, I already talked about the Bread Or. Rador, Mi'kmaq First Nation, no such thing. They just, they're not a separate Mi'kmaq First Nation. They're not recognized by the Mi'kmaq or government. Uh, you've got the Halapu. When the Halapu is a very unique and complicated situation. They used to be the Federation of Newfoundland Indians, a very small number of people. I think at the time when I was researching them, there were about 5,000 people, and they were mostly Mi'kmaq people. They sued the government, then they had a settlement, and part of the settlement was, okay, well, we will grant your First Nation reserve status and band status, so let's work out your membership. Well, they expected far less than even 20,000 to be part of the community. All of a sudden, boom, it's like 100,000. And for those of you in the U.S. who don't know that our First Nations are generally very small, our the largest populated First Nation we have is Six Nations. It's a Mohawk uh, community. 
it's around, it's a little over 20,000, 25,000. So all of a sudden for this massive Mi'kmaq community to just pop up out of nowhere, a hundred thousand people, a fifth of Newfoundland's population. And guess who they didn't consult? The Mi'kmaq nation. So there's a lot of problem. Uh, the federal government has now gone back in partnership with Halibu to take away the recognition of all of these non Mi'kmaq people and fighting others. And so it's a big legal mess. But it's one of those things where when people say they're Mi'kmaq or they're from the Halibu nation, I even have doubts and I'm a Mi'kmaq person. Like I'm starting to question everybody that I see. And of course, there's so many others. Eastern Woodland, Métis Nation. I mean, they've come up with every kind of name possible. The moral of the story is, according to the research, there is no historic Métis group. There's no historic Acadian Métis group. There's no historic Acadian Métis Mi'kmaq group. There's just no other sovereign nation in Mi'kmaq territory other than Mi'kmaq people. That, like, that's it. There's settlers and Mi'kmaq people. Uh, those are the two governing parties, not any of these groups. And just because someone in a position of power or someone who's an academic or a researcher who happens to be Mi'kmaq says, oh, yeah, you know what? I think we should include them. Yeah, I think they're Mi'kmaq. No one person in the Mi'kmaq nation has the power or authority or sovereign ability to just magically make a whole bunch of Mi'kmaq people. That's with the Mi'kmaq nation uh, as a whole. So be careful of that because you will find, you know, with for every group of pretendians, there's a few defendians. So they've been rejected by the Mi'kmaq chiefs in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Uh, they've been rejected, interestingly enough, by the Acadians in New Brunswick and Acadians in Nova Scotia. So the Acadians themselves are saying, what are you talking about? There's no historic Acadian Métis group or Acadian Mi'kmaq group. You're literally just making this stuff up. There's Acadians, there's Mi'kmaq people. There's no kind of weird hybrid group in between. Um, the Métis National Council signed an MOU with the uh, Mi'kmaq chiefs in Nova Scotia to basically say, no, there are no Métis Nation people on the East. And uh, certainly the Mi'kmaq people were saying there's, there's no other group in our territory that has legal standing. So there, uh, and then later on, the Manitoba Métis Federation is also supporting the Mi'kmaq to reject them. Why does this matter? And I don't even know how much time I have left, but uh, very quickly, why does this matter? Well, they represent a very serious threat. One of the things I hear about all the time is, oh, what's the big deal? How does it hurt you, you know, to each their own or just let them be, um, live and let live. But, you know, if you say that to rats, for example, then your house will be infested with rats. And I'm not comparing to the rats. I'm just saying, I told my son that who didn't want to hurt a rat. <sighs> Threats. They are a direct threat, both as individuals and as groups, but in particular as groups, to our inherent sovereignty, our authority and jurisdiction over our territories and our people. They are uh, a direct threat to what's called Aboriginal rights. So in Canada, we have constitutionally protected rights. So our Aboriginal rights, our treaty rights, our land rights, we call it Aboriginal title up here a direct threat to our nationhood, citizenship, and culture, and our safety, sometimes our physical safety. If any of you saw the violence that was happening on the East Coast to Mi'kmaq people when we were asserting our right to fish lobster, our treaty right, our constitutionally protected right, who was out there burning effigies and burning flags and burning down our buildings and shooting at us? People who were proudly identifying as either Acadian or Acadian Métis. So there's a real problem there. And we all, we all know that even just job security, if they file enough complaints, um, that could hurt one of us. Finances, reputation, I mean, you name it, there's a lot of threats. But he, here's the thing that really gets me. Because here's what's not a pretendian. It's not people who have been excluded from the Indian Act because of sex discrimination. 
it's not people who have been forcibly adopted into white families during what's called the 60s scoop forced adoptions. It's not people who were stolen from their families and put into foster care. It's not people who were in Indian boarding schools, Indian residential schools, people who got disconnected from Indian hospitals, Indian day schools, uh, fleeing from violence. All of these people who are legitimately Mi'kmaq, who are trying to reconnect, uh, are not pretendians, but pretendians are trying to appropriate all of our stories of trauma, of dislocation, of separated relationships, and trying to squeeze themselves in there because they know we're going to feel a bit sensitive about questioning someone if they say, well, it's 60 scoop and, you know, I don't have all the information. So we have to approach that with sensitivity, but I wouldn't say uh, a free ride. The other thing is that there are so many red flags, and I don't know if we're going to have a time to talk about this, but um, I'm trying to figure out how far I, I forgot to tie myself. Uh, but but here's the, the moral of my story is big threat, big problem, not just in Mi'kma'ki, but we need to really amp up our public education and advocacy. We need to do like this, targeted symposiums, gatherings, and conferences, and we've been doing that, like Daryl's been on the circuit, I've been on the circuit, targeted research uh, to publish and share widely. So not just in the academic realm, it's really important that the public gets educated and our own people get educated. Uh, tons of social media content. We need to keep track of court cases. Thank you, Daryl, for your website. We have to monitor all of the requests that are going to governments or states or provinces for official recognition. So often, oftentimes this is kind of like a confidential process that happens behind the scenes and we don't know. So we really need to uh, monitor that to stop it before it happens. Because once you, they get recognition, it's a much harder hill to climb and we don't want to make it any harder for ourselves. We have to continually press governments to reject these false claims and rally indigenous voices, allies and experts to really combat pretendianism. And thank goodness there is this amazing resource called raceshifting.com. I know Dr. Daryl's going to talk about it. He's looking at all these fake Métis, and whether you call it Easter Métis, Acadian Métis, Mi'kmaq Métis, Algonquin Métis, Quebec Métis, oh, they're not Métis, and they're not any of those other things. Um, this website keeps track of, there are tons and tons and tons of organizations, I don't even know what they're up to now, and all of the court cases. It's important to know because those court cases can become court of appeal cases or Supreme Court of Canada cases, and we need to know when to intervene. So... If we don't have time for questions afterwards, but you have a question or want to get in contact with me or want to see any of my publications, uh, the easiest thing to do is just go to my website, pampometer.com. I'm on every social media thing possible. I don't know why. Maybe I just like trolls. But <laughs> the moral of the story is here that th we need to be everywhere. We need to be talking about this and not falling into their traps of getting into banters with them. You'll see on all my social media, I don't ever respond to the trolls or the pretendians. I just provide information and if people have legitimate questions, happy to answer them. Um, not going to get into a battle of names or name calling. They call me a pretendian. Um, there you go. So. Hopefully I didn't go over too much. I'm so sorry if I did. As we're waiting for the, the tech to work out, thank you, by the way. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank David, uh, Richard, Jules, uh, Chris. I'm going to forget some names here. Um, let's see. Adrian. <laughs> uh, for um, being a really amazing organizing team. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Gordon for being here and Pam for that uh, great talk. I always love Pam's energy. Um, I don't know if you feel that energy, but it's pretty great. And I especially want to thank um, 
the Abenaki folks who are here from Odenak. Um, so Chief, I, I would like it if you can all stand up and just make your presence known. Yes, that's right. That was great. I was, I was hoping there would be applause. So, uh, thanks so, so much for being here and, um, and really just bringing this struggle to our attention. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know about this if it wasn't for a meeting I had with uh, Jacques and Suzy uh, a number of years ago. And so um, it's really great that you took the time and, and the effort to be here. Um, thank you so much. Um, OK, so this is going to work now? Yeah. Right, so um, uh, this is an image that uh, Richard, uh, uh, who's a great um, uh, researcher s standing at the back, he uh, sent, and it's of uh, children at Camp Abnaki, um, white children from Vermont, um, very visibly playing Indian. Um, I'm not able to tell you the year, um, but uh, Basically, since the 1970s, we see that there's been this exponential increase in the number of um, particularly white Americans who are claiming to be Native American. Um, and so these are some of the names. I think uh, Gordon gave us sort of an overview of some of uh, what that has been called, particularly by academics and scholars, but also people in communities. Um, just to give you a sense here, this exponential increase, I'm not exaggerating. So in the 1960 US Census, there were 552,000 people who identified as Native American. And the important thing to know is that from about the first US Census, so we're saying the mid middle of the 1800s to 1960, the rate of increase in the Native American population was relatively stable. There was an increase, it was lower than the general uh, population increase of the United States, but it was relatively stable. But come 1970, that changes. Uh, and you can see where we are today in 2020, 9.7 million Americans are claiming to be Native American. No, the birth rate has not increased unbelievably. Um, this is really about individuals, usually in their adulthood, deciding, making a choice to change their identities. And so this is just a graph here. Um, uh, Gordon earlier mentioned the work of anthropologist Circe Sturm, who's at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, and so she wrote a really great article you might want to check out. This is from that article in uh, The Conversation. Um, and she sort of did an overview of these numbers. But you can see here, or at least I will kind of attempt to tell you what's going on. The first bar at the top is the percentage of people in the 2010 census who identified as Native American. And it's 1.68% of the US population, which is still very, very high, right? We're talking about over 5 million people. In 2020, it was almost 3%. So this isn't something that only happened in the 70s and 80s. It's actually exponentially increasing at a higher rate in the past 10 years. So this isn't a problem that's going away. It's a problem that we're in the midst of, um, including uh, obviously here in Vermont. Um, and so there are a number of different explanations for this. I'm a sociologist, uh, even though I'm in a political studies department. Uh, and so one of the you know, explanations that I find, exp uh, I think explains things in a way that's useful or productive, um, is really sort of an understanding of what happens post-civil rights era in the United States. Uh, and uh, really there's this, uh, this move among white Americans to escape white identities or to escape whiteness. And the reason for that, as these sociologists who wrote these uh, studies in the 90s sort of conclude, is because the civil rights movement brings about, I guess you can say, a concerned and or um, a movement for accountability in historic and contemporary forms of racial violence, right? Racism and colonialism, settler colonialism. And so white people feel like somehow guilty and or responsible for some of that. One of the easiest ways to get out of that is to no longer be white. Um, and so one of the things that happens increasingly in the 70s is that people who you know, are white Americans, who are really the descendants of immigrants to the US in the late 1800s, Irish, Italian, Polish, etc., they start casting themselves as not quite white, 
uh, and there's the creation of these white ethnic minority groups. Uh, you see Hollywood sort of jumps on the bandwagon with things like Godfather and other films that are really sort of focused on these ethnic minority groups, having a distinction about them, again, not quite white. What's really ironic is that these people's ancestors fought like hell to be seen as white. Right? So when Irish people got here and Italian people got here, they were not considered part of the sort of white, waspy, you know, upper class dominant society. And so what we see is in the 70s and 80s, their descendants are like, well, we're never really totally been white. Um, let's, you know, recast our identity. What happens with those Americans who have, uh, you know, have a presence in the Americas that goes even further back is they sort of start reimagining themselves as Native American. And that's usually those who are self-identifying and creating these sort of groups. Um, so that very much, you know, holds for the groups and what's going on here in Vermont, as I will demonstrate. Uh, as uh, I think it was Gordon was saying, the most common claim in the United States is to a fake Cherokee identity. Um, and so there are literally hundreds of fake Cherokee, quote unquote, tribes in the U.S., some of which have been recognized by states, most of which have not. But the three uh, federally recognized Cherokee tribes, two in Oklahoma, one in North Carolina, are in the midst of always fighting this movement all of the time um, in a legislative, legal, and social and political registers. <clears throat> all right, so uh, one of the things that uh, I think sort of these claims are often based on, my book really focused on um, the way in which genealogy plays into this movement. So people will discover a long ago indigenous ancestor or an ancestor who they can't really, there's something unknown about them and they'll just assume that they're Native American. Um, but one thing I didn't write about in my book and that I'm writing about a book on now is about family lore and sort of the origins of family lore and or its circulation. And so these are two of the ways often that these stories um, are these pe are, that people start claiming these identities either through this genealogical research and or through family lore. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, for instance, um, which I can talk more about later, and Cherokee scholars have talked about a lot um, and written about, um, her story is based on family lore, for instance. It's not actually based on any genealogical knowledge. Uh, and as Gordon pointed out and Pam have pointed out, Native American tribes have really been clear about their opposition to self-identification. Um, and really hold that they are the sort of political entities who get to decide who are um, actually, whether it's Cherokee, whether it's Abenaki, or whatever the case is. Um, and so one important lesson, and I'm sure for those of you who were here last year when uh, Kim, Chris, and Brenda were here, um, this would have come across uh, Native American identity is not principally about blood, even though that's what circulates out there. This idea is you know, as long as you have a drop of blood, you can claim whatever you want. I literally hear people from the groups in Vermont saying that all the time. Um, but it's also about political forms of be uh, belonging. When we make it about race, blood, or genetics, what we do is we attack Native American sovereignty. All right? We, we actually deny them as political entities. And that's what Native American tribes have been very clear about now for several decades. Okay, so the case of Vermont. Um, so there are four um, so-called Abenaki tribes uh, who received state recognition in 2011 and 2012. So two in 2011, two in 2012. This was after more than 30 years of trying. Um, so uh, essentially, I think it was in 76, maybe it was 77, there was a governor who signed an executive order and recognized one of the um, sort of the first, I guess you can say, group that was making these claims. Two years later, a new governor came in in Vermont and um, undid that uh, recognition executive order. In 1982, um, that same first group, which really is sort of where all of the other groups sort of come out of. This is the Mrs. Coy, I guess is what people say in, I, I, it's hard for me to see French words and say them in English, but Mrs. Coy. <clears throat> Uh, in Up in Swanton, that's the first group that sort of exists, they file a petition for federal recognition. The Bureau of Indian Affairs puts together a federal recognition process in 1978. So Mrs. Coy is not the first, but you know, one of the first groups that applies in 82. Um, and right, they, uh, they explain who they see as their ancestors. In 19, I think I'm going to get to this in a second, um, but Essentially, what they do is they name um, what are uh, primary families, is what they call them. 
uh, in the 1800s who they claim were Abenaki. Um, and I'll show how my research demonstrates that they weren't Abenaki at all. So and in Vermont, these quote unquote tribes are treated as Native American tribes when they uh, most certainly aren't. So the movement in Swanton starts really in the late 60s, but they form a group in 1974. And that petition, which I mentioned earlier, which was filed in 82, there was uh, an amended version that was filed in 86. And then there was another version filed in 95. Um, <clears throat> it was eventually rejected by the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the federal recognition process in 2006, which is really, in what is really interesting is that the state of Vermont, the Attorney General's office, put out a report um, as part of that. They were able to sort of respond to the federal petition and you know, d let the federal government know whether or not they agree with um, what the, this group is saying in their application. And the state of Vermont, the Attorney General's office, did a really, I think, a really great job of researching their claims. Um, and they uh, opposed the petition very clearly. That was in 2002. Uh, and then it was released in 2003. It's still online. You can read that report it um, more or less comes up with the same conclusions that I do, just the little differences around the edges, I suppose you can say. Uh, and the primary reason, one of the primary reasons, there were a few, but uh, one of the primary reasons that really sort of stands out in both the federal decision and this, the state's research into this is that the group wasn't able to demonstrate that they actually descend from Abenaki people. And that's obviously key if you're going to say that you're Abenaki or you're going to say you're Cherokee, whatever the case is, you have to demonstrate that at some point in time, you actually had Abenaki people, or in the case of Cherokee, in your lineage, right? And so they have not been able to um, demonstrate that because they do not have Abenaki ancestors. <clears throat> And so, like I was saying earlier, in 1982, they talked about having 20 primary families. I'm going to call them root ancestors because that's generally the way it's discussed in research in Indigenous studies. And so, um, in 1986, which I, I mentioned this in my article, it's kind of surprising to look at it because they go from having 20 families, which, you know, there may be five, six people per family, maybe a little bit more. In 1986, they go to having 200 families in the Swanton area in the 1800s um, with thousands of members. Those are literally what they say, are thousands of Abenaki people. In 1995, they again winnow down the number of uh, families to uh, 20. So um, what I did in my research is that I actually um, went to those families. Uh, I sort of did the genealogy, not of living members today, but of the families that they're saying are Abenaki. So, um, so they name these people in all of their petitions, the couples in particular, they say that they're Abenaki. Um, they are mostly people who arrive in Vermont uh, between 1815 and about the 1880s. The mean year of arrival is 1840s. They're largely immigrants from Quebec, although two of these 20 families are actually um, uh, from further south in the US. So there's a, uh, an English, an English-American family uh, from Massachusetts and a Dutch-German family from the Hudson River Valley. Um, and so what I was planning on doing was showing you how to do this um, sort of research. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do that because I didn't get onto the website, but I'll show you the types of results that you come up with. So this here is one of the databases that exists in, um, in Quebec. It's uh, free. It's called the Research Program in Historical Demography. One thing to know, so before I even started working on this topic, I uh, studied sort of the use of genealogy. I did my own family's genealogy and I was kind of fascinated with it. One of the reasons that um, uh, genealogy is so important in Quebecois and also French Canadian communities is because it's more or less the most complete set of genealogical documents and records for a period of 400 years for any ethno-national community in the world. And so the reason for that is the Catholic Church had a law in place uh, when the French arrived in New France, and uh, it was that you're not allowed to marry anyone closer than a third cousin. Um, and so literally priests would take do people's family trees. Uh, so when you were born and when you had different sort of vital records, uh, you're married, and when you died, they would add that information to these trees. Now let's say that part of the room all lives in a town in sort of New France. You're all of the village. 
And then at some point, half of you decide you're going to go to another village. That's sort of a new village and you want to go live on another river or whatever the hell you want to do. And so <clears throat> when you move, the church goes with you. The church stays. The church goes with you, opens a new parish. And the priest in that community copies all of the family trees. And they all follow the, you there. Because how are they going to know? Because remember, communication and transport is kind of difficult. How are they going to know if it's not your first cousin or your second cousin? Right? And so there are literally hundreds of these documents, well actually at this point millions of these documents um, that have been retained in these records. And so this project at the University of Montreal has been ongoing since 1966. It has received the largest amount of social science and humanities research funding in Canadian history, literally tens of millions of dollars to digitize handwritten documents from the 16, 17 and 1800s. Um, and so there are millions of documents. You can literally find anyone, if you happen to be a French descendant like me, um, and you wanted to see who your ancestors were, you would be able to uh, sort of trace your whole lineage to the early 1600s without really much of a problem. And so that's what I did. I went on this database and I searched for these 18 primary families that were clearly French Canadian from their names. I found each of those primary families in this database, and then I just followed going backwards. And you do that by looking at the birth records, the marriage records, and vital records like death records. And so I'll give you an example of what this looks like. One of the primary families is the Saint Laurent family, just like the river, the Saint Lawrence River. So it's the Saint Laurent family, pretty common name. Uh, it actually is from a place in France called Saint Laurent. So that I found out by doing this research. And so his, his wife was uh, Elizabeth Pinel La France. Um, so this is a, a file that's made on this database. So I'm going to just show you. This is what a record looks like. Now, you can imagine that if you, there, first of all, it's in French. So that makes it less accessible, I suppose, to the larger community. But it's also very difficult to read. Uh, once you read them over and over again, you sort of get tricks and you understand how they're organized and you kind of understand it's a lot of the same words. It's not like priests are writing a novel, right? They're literally detailing the same thing. Um, so this is actually, uh, I'll come back to this in a moment, but so what they've done is they've taken these original records and they've created these files for them. So if you were to go on their website and you wanted to find someone's birth record, they've made it much more accessible for you so you don't have to read through. That's how they got tens of millions of dollars. You can imagine it's a lot of work over, over 50 years now that they've been doing this. And they're at 1861 now. Uh, so since I wrote the paper, in the paper I said they have all of the records and sort of acts until 1851. They've actually added 10 years in the past few years of documents. Their goal is to put all of the records that exist in the history of French Canadians um, on this website. Um, and so you can see here that the root ancestor, whose name is Hippolyte, or I don't know how to say that in English, but we'll just say Hippolyte <laughs> Saint Laurent and his father. And so this is them telling you that in, in the baptismal record, um, and this is common in these records, we just saw a baptismal record, I'll get back to it, but so it'll have the person's name in the left margin and then in the sort of written text, it'll name their parents. And usually it'll say the legitimate child of this person and this person of this parish. Sometimes it says a legitimate child, but very rarely. Um, and so the second uh, file here uh, is the marriage between those two root ancestors I was talking about. And that's another document where the people's, those individuals' parents will be listed, right? So when you're going through these files as a researcher, you make sure that the parents match who you think they do so that you can go back and find those people's parents in the rest, the, the previous documents. And then you can find those, you see what I mean? So essentially in every document, the baptism, the marriage and the death records, it will list an individual and their parents. Um, you know, some, once in a while, maybe one of those documents doesn't, but that's more or less how it works. And so you can see here, again, Hippolyte in this file, his father, same as these two people, so no difference, pretty trustworthy in this case, and her parents are listed here. So once you do that, you essentially just follow the line all the way back to the 1600s. Um, and so uh, you can see here, there's a link. It says, view the original document. So you can click on that and it'll bring you this. 
So if you wanted to look at the document yourself, because you're like, well, maybe they transcribed it wrong, which is uh, what you do as a researcher. You want to make sure that the original says what someone who transcribed it says, which is what I did for every single one of these documents, which is why it took months and months of work. Um, and so I went through it, and uh, let's see here. I'm going to try to read part of this. Okay, so this is actually his father, just to give you an example. So remember Hippolyte, who's here, his father's Philip. Do you see that? Philip Saint Laurent, and he's Philip Saint Laurent there too. Sometimes also known as Charbonnier. It's a bit complicated. There are these nicknames that people were given, so they have two last names often. And yeah, we'll just leave it there. And so you can see here that it's, it says Philippe Charbonnier. Remember, that's one of his last names. So that's him. And you can see it lists, it says his father's name, which is here. Antoine Charbonnier, Charlotte Guinard. That's his mother and his father. So that's if you're looking at the record and you wanted to see who the parent is. Just in case you saw the file that they created and you weren't sure about it, that's how you would look for it. Um, and so I did this for the 18 families that are French Canadian and, um, uh, you know, discovered that all of them are French Canadian. Um, virtually every single one of their ancestor goes back to France. I'm related to many of these individuals in, um, in Vermont, as you would expect. So is Celine Dion. I love talking about Celine Dion because she's kind of famous. She's kind of famous. But um, Celine Dion has a Mi'kmaq ancestor. She does. Celine Dion does not say she's Mi'kmaq. Um, so good for Celine. Uh, oh, and I have uh, also three indigenous ancestors, which is quite common for French Canadians. My research in my book, which I discuss, you know, it actually shows that about 75% of French descendants have a small number of indigenous ancestors, mostly born before 1650. Nothing unusual about it. About 10 million Canadians is what that represents, and about two to three million Americans, right? And so it's not something that makes you um, indigenous in any way. It's just something that's part, actually, of French Canadian history. Um, and so this is uh, Homer St. Francis's sort of family tree. Homer St. Francis is the first um, sort of our most well-known quote-unquote chief of, um, of these groups in, um, I was gonna say Nova Scotia, in Vermont. And uh, what I just want to point out is, so this is an example of someone who I think, um, well, it'll make more sense when I, when I come in a second, but so Homer is related to five of the primary families, which is not unusual, because if you think about it, we're talking about a relatively small number of Quebec immigrants in a particular region of Vermont who just intermarry with each other, right, for several generations. And so Homer is related to, you see Hippolyte up there? Saint Laurent. He's also related to Joseph Colomb through another line. He's related to this man, Mitchell Saint Francis, who's actually Michel Saint Francois. But once he comes to Vermont, changes his name. He works on a farm. He's a farm hand, and he comes to Vermont alone when he's 16. Um, Flavien Hogue. Uh, the name changes in uh, Quebec. It's H O G U E. These are all very common names, by the way, in in Quebec today still. So Hog, Saint Francois, Saint Laurent, Colomb. You know, I think people who live in Quebec would agree. You, you hear those names fairly often. You might even see a hockey player with one of those names. And then the other, the fifth one is Eli Hakey. Um, so that's also, strangely enough, a, a French Canadian name from Quebec. And so Homer is related to five of these families um, and reimagines himself as particularly Abenaki because he has all of these different Abenaki lines, but really they're French Canadian. And I'll explain sort of the importance of that in a second. Okay, so the state recognition process, um, as I, I sort of uh, started to really delve into this, I was trying to understand, well, if there's such obvious and compelling evidence that these groups do not re represent um, Abenaki people in any way and have no Abenaki ancestry, how did the state of Vermont recognize them as such? And why did they recognize them after writing a report saying they weren't Abenaki? That's something I still don't understand. I went to Montpelier, as you call it today, and uh, I, it's hard to tell. You see it, you're like, how am I supposed to say that? Virgin? <laughs> and so uh, I met with a couple legislators and, they, legislators, and they couldn't really answer that question because they weren't around when that report was written. Um, but so the state recognition process, uh, I discovered, involved a number of different conflicts of interest. 
And one of, the, I think, the major flaws was that it barred participation from Abenaki people. So there were actual Abenaki people, some of whom lived in Vermont, who are connected to Odenak, some of whom uh, live in the sort of greater Albany area and have lived there for a long time. There's a few hundred people who are connected to Odenak who are Abenaki and live in Albany, um, tried to participate in this process. But sort of at the last moment, they were barred, even though they had meetings uh, in different, at different hearings, and they weren't allowed. So you needed to, live, you needed to be uh, essentially a, a member of one of these groups to be heard about what it means to be Abenaki in Vermont. Um, okay. So I think the biggest flaw in my mind, and I told this today to the legislators, they're like, what do you want us to know? And so this is what I really wanted them to know, is just if you were to look into this properly, you would see that these are not the descendants of Abenaki people, which means they're not Abenaki people. That's it, right? It's pretty simple. Um, one way that this was done, though, through the process, it's not so much that the law that the, or the bill that was passed was problematic. There were some problems with it. I'm just going to read this to you, though. This is, uh, I'm not sure what this symbol represents. In a, in a bill? Subsection. Subsection. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Subsection 853C2. A substantial number of the applicants' members are related to each other by kinship and trace their ancestry to a kinship group through genealogy or other methods. Genealogical documents shall be limited to those that show a, uh, it's supposed to say descendancy, but it says decadency. <laughs> Too much Ben and Jerry's from identified Vermont or regional native people. So it's pretty clear that they're saying, you need, well, it's somewhat clear, <laughs> that you need to be descended from actual native people. But what happened was each of the applicants, so a group could apply, and then there were three sort of uh, presumably independent assessors for each of the applica applications. One of the conflicts of interest is that, uh, so there's four groups, they apply, each has three, they're repeated a few times, so there's seven different assessors. Six of them had worked for one of these groups before, including people who worked for them at the time that they were assessing them. So to me, that's a pretty serious conflict of interest. But this is the sort of uh, review and how they write out um, whether or not they're being recognized. In this case, these two groups were. A substantial number of the applicants' members trace their ancestry to a kinship group through genealogy or other members uh, or other methods. What is different about that statement than the actual subsection. There's a very big difference. So it's around this here. So they trace their ancestry to a kinship group, not an Abenaki kinship group. So the assessors actually measured whether or not these people were related, not whether or not they were related to Abenaki people. That's a pretty serious flaw. <laughs> and so, it's true if we go back here to, uh, for instance, Homer's um, uh, genealogy, which you might not be able to see very well. I'm sorry, it's smaller than I thought it would be. But remember, he's tied to five of these families. So he's literally going to be rel related to uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of members of this group, right? Because he's, he's related to f five, a quarter of their root families. And so it's true. All of the applicants demonstrated that they're related to each other but not that they're related to Abenaki people. Um, another thing that I, I sort of uh, realized doing this research is that um, when it comes to the recognition of particular groups um, in the United States, that hardly ever happens in states with um, a strong federally recognized tribal presence or a large proportion of the um, a Native American population in the US. And so uh, if we just look over at Maine, not quite a neighbor, but almost, um, there was a similar effort that happened there. There was a group that called themselves the Westgate Sipu. They said that they were um, uh, actually Acadians, Mi'kmaq, and Maliseets. Sound familiar? Uh, they were based in one of the sort of towns that are primarily Acadian, actually uh, also quite French speaking in Kent County, right on the border with New Brunswick. Um, and so they actually went forward and said they were Native American. The state recognized them in the sense that they gave them uh, free uh, sort of hunting and fishing licenses for life. 
Uh, and then there was a bill presented to uh, the legislature that was drafted by people who are sort of supportive of their claims uh, that would have given them a free tuition at state um, universities and institutions and a few other elements. I think they would have gotten a certain number of moose tags. So they would have been able to hunt, uh, I think it was 75 moose per year, their members would have. Um, and so the four state rec uh, federally recognized tribes in Vermont, the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet, the, Penos the Penobscot, and the Passamaquoddy, Maine, sorry, I don't know what I said, but I didn't say Maine. The four federally recognized tribes in Maine got wind of this, two of whom actually sit in the legislature, and they opposed it, um, and they were able to stop that bill. Now, if there was a similar situation in Vermont, I think it's almost certain that these groups would never have been state recognized, right? But because there isn't that pre presence on the ground, then it does make it easier for these false claims to sort of circulate and in a way embed themselves in sort of the social and political life of a particular state. Okay, so I am now going to debunk some of the major claims that have been made by these groups, particularly uh, even recently uh, as a sort of warm up to this event. Uh, one of the claims, and I've sort of quoted um, in a way some of the statements that were made recently, the Abenaki did not all move to Canada, some stayed behind. Um, so that's one of their claims. Remember that that claim depends on the fact that they're saying that for about 150 years, almost 200 years, a group of Abenaki people lived in sort of the swamps near Swanton, um, in sort of Missisquoi, the Missisquoi National Refuge, more or less. Um, so they were hiding, is what they generally say. But what's actually, um, what's actually ha what actually happened is that after sort of these wars, and even in the middle of them, uh, in the late 1700s that were occurring between the United States and Britain, uh, the Abenaki people did move mostly as refugees towards Odenak, which was really the sort of center and still is the center of Abenaki life. But after a generation or two, a number of Abenaki families did return to their territories and or uh, the territories adjacent to their traditional territory in New York State. And um, it's really kind of hard to believe as someone who studies these issues that the Abenaki people at Odenak would not have known about dozens of families or even a dozen families living not very far from where they live would have literally abandoned them at a time when they were facing literally el elimination. That's not how one uh, lives their kinship obligations, right? And so you would, even if it's one family, you would make sure that that family, you would know that family that they were taken care of and that you would ensure that you know where they were and where they were going, right? But in this sort of version of history, somehow they just pop out in the 1970s after hiding for all these years and are sort of completely separate from Odenak, um, which is just not believable. Over time, uh, we mix with European settlers, but so did the ones who ended up at Odenak. Why aren't we asking them for genealogies? Um, we were actually going to do Danielle's genealogy today. Hey, Danielle. <laughs> Danielle, uh, um, who uh, yeah, is related to a number of Abenaki people <laughs> at, at, at Odenak and is himself Abenaki. But um, we decided not to because, as you can see, I'm taking more time than I thought I would. Um, but I think what's important here is that it's not really a problem of mixing. No one's saying that, you know, Indigenous peoples haven't mixed. The problem here is really about um, the fact that these Vermont groups have no Abenaki ancestry. They are trying to distract us from that, right? They're trying to forward arguments and rhetoric that take us away from the actual facts. They cannot account for the fact that they have no Abenaki ancestry and they are not Abenaki people because of it. Odenak doesn't see us as related to them because we aren't related to their families. We have our own families who stayed here. I just sort of addressed that. Um, again, it's, incredu it's in incredulous that uh, somehow people at Odenak would not have known about these family members um, who lived just across the border. These are territories that the Abenaki people lived in um, for uh, centuries, but that particular region of, um, of Vermont for time immemorial, right? And these are important sites. And that's why Abenaki people came back to their territory. If you look at newspaper reports, reports of anthropologists through the 1800s and the 1900s, they're full of reports of Abenaki people in Vermont, in New Hampshire, and also in New York State. 
right? Uh, they're not necessarily always living there permanently. Sometimes they come for the summer months. Sometimes they come to fish in a particular river or stream in the spring. But these are people who are coming back to their territories that make sense to them as people. Their stories about who they are are based in this land, right? And so not being able to cross that border puts a stop to those relationships and who you are as Abenaki. So of course the Abenaki have returned and continue to live throughout their traditional territory. But again, they are not the people who are claiming to be so in Vermont. Census and vital records aren't reliable because they weren't looking to establish Indigenous identity. The only people they recognized as Indians were those connected to reservations. So this is a trope that you hear a lot from um, people who are making false claims to Indigenous identity. There are just no records. The church burnt down. I kind of tried to address that earlier. It's not like there was one church with all the records or two churches. There were literally copies that circulated quite widely. We have actual records and literally you and I and whoever wants to can go find those records. They're there. They're there for the people they claim were their Abenaki families. They weren't, the records are there. Perhaps there are some records that don't exist, but they're not the ones that are tied to the people they're claiming. Um, the other thing that's important too is that in my uh, research, I did uh, look at census records and vital records for more contemporary people. So uh, essentially from the 1850s to, I think it was as far as like 1970. Um, and every single time that race is included as a category in those documents, whether it's the census, whether it's a birth record, a death record, every single time, the descendants of all of these families are identified as white. They're never identified as something else. So that was, I think in my paper, 169 different times uh, or more. There's an appendix at the end that is pages long and tells you every single document that you know, um, I, I consulted. Claim five, we have, uh, what we have is oral tradition. Our ancestors hid their identities for good reason, but maintain traditions. What they have is family lore. Now there's a difference between oral history and family lore. And oral history, as it's sort of been theorized and sort of thought through, both in a legal realm, but also in an academic realm, it has protocols attached to it. And it's not just something your grandmother tells you, right? It's something that people in the community are charged with actually sort of making sure gets circulated in that community. It, these are the knowledge holders as they're known, right? And what we see here in these groups is that, uh, and actually at this press conference they had this week, one of the statements was grandmothers don't lie. Well, <laughs> and that's what I'm talking about when it comes to family lore. The, question, the, the issue isn't that grandmothers don't lie. It's th that's a way to insulate yourself from critique. No one wants to say your granny was a liar, right? But what happens in families, as I'm sure everyone here knows, is that previous generations, so whether it's grandmothers or great grandmothers or even your parents, will shield things from their descendants, particularly things that are shameful about ancestors, about family members, because it's understood that there's stigma or shame attached to those experiences, and it's something that as you know, a, a descendant that they're charged for, you're better not to know. Maybe when you're old enough, maybe that's something you've heard before, right? But there's ways in which families hide things, create secrets, and that's sort of to manage uh, a family's reputation uh, and also to manage the forms of shame that circulate in a family. And so it's not a question of whether grandmother lied. It's just that we always get misleading information through family members there's nothing unusual about that. It's just that some of that information, in this case, has led us to believe we're Native American, right? And that's something that people today want to believe. And so they don't question the story, they don't go back to its origins, and they certainly don't want to look at the records that exist. It's better to think they don't exist, bury your head in the sand. Odenak accepted us in the past, but now have turned against us. It's true. There were people at Odenak, including some leaders who did sort of cozy up with some of these groups in the 70s and 80s. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how to explain that, except to say that people were not necessarily aware that uh, the basis of these claims, and also it was not, it was sort of a new movement. There weren't that many people who were coming out of the woodwork saying, I want to be Native American, right, in the 1970s. So I'm sure that some people at Odenak were like, wow, this is great. All of these people we didn't know who are now saying they're with us, it also helped that they were getting paid, right, to come and share culture and, and share songs and share language at a time when I'm sure that was very useful. And so that's true. 
The reality is today, and actually for over 20 years, the people at Odenac have taken the same stand. We do not know who you are. You are not part of our families. You are not Abenaki. And that's what I think should stand. Our critics at Odenac and the University of Vermont are funded by Hydro-Quebec or other corporate interests. So <clears throat> this is a, a, a story that has been circulated by um, members of these groups. I won't name by whom, but um, you even see it sometimes in the media. Journalists will ask often, is this true? I, I mean, and I'm kind of like, uh, how do you answer that? Because it's so absurd. Where's my check? Yeah, where is my check? But um, no. <laughs> None of us here are getting any kickbacks from Hydro-Quebec. I have never heard any of the Abenaki people who I know say, we want all that land in Vermont, or we want it for Hydro-Quebec, or, or whatever this sort of is imagined as. And I don't think there are any professors at UVM who are like, I'm doing this for um, Hydro-Quebec. So there are no hidden um, or dark corporate interests involved in this. This is really about supporting the Abenaki people. Um, as an academic, I do research. My research happens to, you know, um, in some way be used in that way. And so uh, that's sort of just something that sometimes comes about when you're an academic. One thing that they were saying about me was that I'm a mercenary or a hitman. I thought it was a bit of an escalation. I'm Canadian. We don't have the same gun culture. So I was a bit like, <laughs> I don't know, guys. I don't know. I do hunt and I have a rifle. But I don't, you know, I was like, oh, this is uncomfortable. I don't know, guys. You got to ramp up the security. Um, but yeah, I'm glad that you found that funny. Um, really, like I explained, I'm an academic who kind of stumbled upon this situation while doing research. It sort of emerged organically from my general research on sort of French Canadian forms of racism and colonialism, which I've been doing for more than 20 years. And I shared my research with the academic community and also with uh, Indigenous peoples who I've been working with. So um, that is the reality. Okay, so in the case of Vermont, these uh, Abenaki tribes are entrusted with human remains for reburial, which I think is really perverse. Like just so problematic. I don't want to speak about it anymore because I will get very upset. Receive funding for social programs, rewrite education curriculum, run the state's commission on Native American affairs, produce and market Native American art. So under this year, there's, a, there's actually a federal law. It's called the Native American Arts and Crafts Act. It was passed in 1995. And that act essentially means that if you're not Native American, you're not allowed producing Native American art. You can be charged with a crime because there's a lot of sort of, believe it or not, um, black market Native American art that was produced and uh, wasn't actually created by Native American people. That law though actually says you can come from a federally recognized tribe or a state recognized tribe. And that's why this group actually lobbied very hard to be recognized, as I found out today. This is one of their major reasons. So there are 100 people who are calling themselves Abenaki, who are producing art and selling it, who are not in the state of Vermont. They receive free lifetime hunting and fishing licenses and receive property tax exemptions on their offices and buildings. And as I found out today, they are being gifted um, land as part of this sort of land back movement by mostly elderly people. Uh, uh, one of my sort of colleagues called it elder fraud or maybe abuse. Um, there's a woman recently who donated 324 acres of land to one of the so-called tribes. Um, so yes, call that what you will. This is my paper, State Recognition and the Dangers of Race Shifting, the Case of Vermont. It's open sourced. It's in the American Indian Culture and Research Journal. So you can um, look it up if you'd like, uh, if you have any um, things you want to verify but what I said this is me you can uh, email me I'm very active on Twitter or at least I used to be I know it's called something else but Elon Musk is a jerk I think we're going to take questions in a bit but we had a request uh, from uh, for, for someone to read a statement is Dana here Dana Uh, sure. Uh, 
Nadeli we see Lois Dana, Nijia we Alnabe Menahan, Panawapskoe, Nea Panawapskoe. Hi, my name is Lois Dana, and I'm from uh, uh, Indian Island, Maine. That's where my family is from. Uh, today, I'm just going to be reading uh, a message from my cousin, um, uh, who is the Penobscot tribal citizen, but also the ambassador for Penobscot Nation. To whom it may concern, my name is Molly and Dana Bryant, and I am Penobscot tribal citizen, as well as serving as the current tribal ambassador. I have over 20 years of experience in activism and policy making on issues of cultural appropriation, Indian mascots, federal Indian law, environmental protection and sacred sites, religious rights for tribes, missing and murdered indigenous women, tribal sovereignty and social justice. I'm a former elected tribal council member and serve as the president of the board of directors of the Wabanaki Alliance. I have helped to craft major pieces of state legislation for Maine when dealing with the Wabanaki nations here and have worked in Washington DC on many occasions representing the tribe. I have followed the story of the state recognized tribes in Vermont and the concerns raised by Abenaki leaders from Odenak. I'm writing in support of the leaders of Odenak of Odenak Abenaki because they are our ancestral relatives and this has been and this homeland is the one that we share with them. The Abenaki people have been in the lands now called Maine since time immemorial, this, the same as the federally recognized uh, tribes that are formerly in our organization. They were displaced by violent land grabs, genocidal acts, and many and the many other atrocities of colonization. They are part of the Wabanaki Confederacy and stand with their efforts to protect their legitimate people from the harm of state recognized groups who have circumvented federal recognition guidelines and formalities in favor of looser state process that doesn't take into account the standards that our tribes have met. An important tenet of Tribal sovereignty is that tribes have the authority over how they determine membership and how they run their government and departments. Even with our struggles in Maine with the 1980 Settlements Act, we enjoy this level of sovereignty. It is imperative that we protect the validity of tribal communities to combat the historical trauma that our people have suffered for generations. The theft of land, resources, children, religion, and our very lives left us greatly diminished, but we are still here. Our ancestors ensured through their sacrifices that we not only survived, but that we still know who we are and that our cultural identity remains. It is miraculous and helps us heal. When groups cannot meet the standard for recognition in the ways our tribes can, it should signal that something is amiss. While we acknowledge that the federal recognition process is absolutely a remnant of the colonization that we're healing from, it does serve as a way to establish some sort of verifiable truth signaling indigenous identity. The Abenaki of Odenak have met criteria as our tribal nations have and when they raise issues with other groups, I believe them and support them. There is harm in groups claiming to be indigenous when they're unable to prove out those claims. Much like the harm from stereotypical Indian sports mascots, we see a group taking on the historical trauma and modern day consequences of that identity. It also diminishes the valid tribal nation's rights and opportunities. It's challenging enough to make progress and improvements for tribal communities as it is without having to wade through these matters of state recognized tribes. Thank you for the opportunity to weigh in and support the Abenaki of Odenak. Willie Winnie. Well, we have some questions here for the panelists, Daryl and Pam, um, that, that were submitted and passed on to me. And the, one of the first is, what do you suggest PK through 12 educators can do to help school districts stop relying on longtime creators of false narratives when they host speakers and events? And coupled with that, 
In some cases, there are comparatively limited alternative curricular materials and books about indigenous people of the Northeast and Vermont specifically. So somewhere in there, I guess there's a question about ways of uh, mm -hmm. enhancing the education. Sure. Mm -hmm. Any? I was just wondering if Pam has something she wants to say. Sure, I can give a, a quick response to that. Um, I work a lot with school districts here in Canada, and it's one of the most common questions. Okay, what do we do now? Because they have been relying for decades on self-identification, and they felt like they didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So, you know, I've said, well, look, you're worried about hurting someone's feelings versus trampling all over the sovereign rights and constitutionally protected rights and internationally protected rights of First Nations to determine their own citizenship. And so, there, you know, again, their response will be, well, you know, should it really be us making that decision? And it's like, no, it should never be you. But there are, like, literally right beside you are local First Nations. If you had a relationship with local First Nations, you could come up with a process that they agreed to where, you know, lots of us, I'd say the vast majority of us can prove who we are. Um, it's very, very easy. We have like a membership a card or in Canada, it's a status Indian card. But for the small number where there's some question, it's easy contact the local First Nation. If you already have a relationship, they will tell you. In terms of content, this is a bigger problem because <clears throat> states and provinces come up with curriculum or you've gotten your curriculum from well-known pretendians. Again, if you have local First Nations or tribes and local experts who you know are attached to First Nations or tribes, and you go online and follow all of these authentic indigenous peoples, you're going to get a lot of content and you'll see, wait a second, here's authentic content and here's Wikipedia, Google native content. And you'll be able to identify that easily once you get into it. Oh, I think one of the things that makes that type of work difficult in this particular context is if you have a state um, that recognizes these groups under the law and you work for the state, um, then I can see how that, you know, taking uh, any sort of stance that would sort of question these groups obviously puts your job at risk. It puts all kinds of different things that you may rely on for your own safety and security at risk. So I think that comes back to the state recognition process and the role of the legislature in particular. Um, I think just from our meeting today that we had, there are some people in um, Montpelier who are um, open and ready to um, take some steps. I don't know if it would be so much to undo the state recognition, but definitely to reconsider it. Um, and so I would urge those of you who live here and um, have a connection and or sort of an avenue to speak with your representatives. I'm not generally someone who's like, go to your representatives, they'll fix everything. But because the question was specifically about, you know, state working for a state institution, then I do think that um, that would be something that would make these sort of conversations a bit easier if there was an acknowledgement by the legislature um, that their previous recognition process was deeply flawed. I mean, I would urge them to just redo the whole thing um, and to get actual experts to vet these applications. And I'm sure that we would come up with very different results. Excellent. Thanks for the response. Uh, we have another and it says, who in Vermont should we turn to for indigenous authority when working with uh, lands of indigenous archeology span archaeological significance, knowing the peoples who may have been historically, I'm trying, some of this is written, uh, um, are no longer have, can you, can you read that? Have a specific, specific connection to the, uh, to the land. So I guess they're asking who, who's, who can we legitimately work with for archaeological kinds of issues related to the land here? That's the question. Yeah. Um, I think that this might be a good time to invite um, maybe Susie or Danielle, uh, maybe even Chief Rick. Um, there might be a way that you have some answers to this. Um, Odenak, by the way, has a really brilliant museum. Um, it's really worth visiting. It's not too far. I know I'm sure many of you love going to Montreal. Odenak is not in Montreal. 
but it is uh, not too far away. It's straight north of here. So I would um, suggest that if you do want to find out more about Abenaki people, that would be one way to um, start that process. And there's also a lot of public events there that are open to the public. So um, I'm not able to speak to that question about archaeology, but uh, I do know that Odenak is involved a lot in terms of land-based sort of research. So, um, yeah, did, did you want to say? Yeah. No, no, that, that's, uh, that's good. Well, first of all, they, they may just uh, want to contact us uh, and the Bureau of uh, Indakina, the Indakina office at the Tribal Council, and we'll be looking uh, to uh, uh, take care of this, uh, you know, this back, yeah. Okay. Great. I can, just, I can just take one second. Yeah. Um, just before we go any further, um, as the, uh, the chief of the Abenaki Nation of Odenak, I would like to first of all uh, thank our Penobscot brothers and sisters for all their support. Thank you. Yeah, so there's an office. And Nadikana? Nadikina? Nadikina. Nadikina. Um, and the tribal council. So that's one way um, to, I think, start building those relationships with the Abenaki people. Obviously, there's going to be a capacity thing if uh, hundreds of people contact them and are like, can you help us with this? That could be difficult, but I still think that that's a really good starting spot. Um, and they do have some uh, capacity when it comes to these types of questions. I love that there are kids here. So there's another uh, question related somewhat to the first. It says, I work at a respected Vermont institution which has spent decades building partnerships with these self-identified people. I'm ready to redirect my energy toward fact-based solidarity work with Odenak and Waldenak folks, but I need to know, show another path forward for my colleagues and institution. I believe the big reason why people, organizations, and universities don't leave these fake tribes is because they are too afraid. What do you suggest? <laughs> well, first of all, um, it's perfectly understandable, okay, that right off the bat, everybody would have went to a lot of these people. They're there. They're close. The information sounds right. I guess the biggest thing we're asking is, is call us. We're more than willing to work with any institution. We're more than work, willing to work with anyone in order to bring the truth out and to bring what our real history and the important history of Vermont up front. So we're asking you to support us in this. And if you need information, we're there. We have a very good museum, as we had mentioned. We have the Indakina, which is, which is our land, where they take care of our lands. They know the history. We know our areas. We know where we're from. We know our territories. So the information is there. All you gotta do is call. All you gotta do is reach out to us. We have made this trip several times to Vermont. So we have no problem coming over and speaking and talking to people about it. We are very open. We have a few other questions as well. So um, after the presentations today, I understand more dearly than ever how the vacuum of indigenous pre presence in Vermont enabled the race shifting and recognition of tribes in Vermont. Are there, any, are there any initiatives in place in so-called Vermont to increase Odenak presence and sovereignty in this part of Turtle Island? Funny thing is at this point, even the Native Commission doesn't allow me to speak. I spoke once at the Native Commission and, and I've been asked not to come back. If I come back, I'm not allowed to talk. So is there any initiative for us to have a chance? We're hoping things like this open the doors. It's the reason we went to the United Nations. We're hoping that the state of Vermont will open the doors and start to listen to us. Because so far, what we've received is closed doors and our own land and our own territory. Understand that this is where my ancestors come from. My ancestors' remains are scattered all over Vermont. And I have no rights. I have no say. But I have new people coming up and they get to have all the say and all the rights on my family. Trust me, inside that hurts. So we're hoping that things like this and with people like you coming and listening and starting to understand what the real story behind this is and the reasoning for us speaking out, 
Use our people of Vermont. Speak up, speak loud, and welcome us back home. Beverly wants to speak here, so I'll turn it over to her. Yeah, I would like to say that as a Lakota woman, I was brought to Vermont 20 years ago. I have no idea why I was sent to Vermont, but Spirit had plans for me here. As every time I have gone into a different territory of different nations, I've sought to connect with the indigenous people of that land because I want to respect that land and respect their ancestors as I would want mine respected. And the first thing that I had encountered was these self-identified groups. There are many other nations that live here in Vermont today. And anytime we speak out, we are silenced. I was on the Commission for Native American Affairs when I confronted someone who had told us, told myself and several other women on a Zoom call that they were not indigenous. And when I confronted them at a commission meeting, they said, well, I am indigenous. I just not indigenous in the way that you would define it. I got up and walked out and I have never returned. I will not sit in a circle that is full of self-identified people and who are making decisions for their own little groups. A commission on Native American affairs should in be inclusive of all indigenous people living within its boundaries. And this trashing of the Odenak people pains me, but it also lights a fire under me because I will fight for them. I will be there supporting them all the way and have no, no doubt that I have received really nasty uh, emails and been confronted by some people whom I have thought were my friends, but it has been a good experience because I have learned who I can turn to as a friend and who I need to walk away from. I'm very connected to my people in North Dakota. I go back and forth, but I live here now. So it is my responsibility to put pressure on the legislature and to voice my concern to anyone who will listen, one person at a time. And each one of you who is in this audience can do the same. And without Piazza. Any of these questions are pointing in the same direction, I guess. Um, one that I thought was interesting, and I don't know if Daryl or Pam has an answer for this, is how have organizations which have been tricked by other fake groups responded and moved forward in true solidarity with indigenous people? Pam, do you want to answer that or do you want me to start? If the question was how or should they, yes, uh, they should. It's happening now in Canada. I mean, we've had a historic MOU with the Métis Nation and Mi'kmaq Nation, and we now have a coming together of Métis Nation people, uh, Mi'kmaq people, all the First Nations in Ontario. Um, we're coming together for that purpose. We don't have to agree with each other on everything all the time for everything but on this issue it impacts all of us and so yeah we we've got uh, lots of collaboration and i think that that can happen um i obviously i'm not from v vermont so uh, i respectfully turn it over to someone else to talk about the vermont situation but um the more we come together, the more we're going to be able to successfully defeat it. And we actually have legislation before Parliament right now to recognize a, f a primarily fake Métis organization. And it's great to see other Métis organizations coming out against it. 
Um, I think I would say that there aren't that many examples. So one of the things that happens, we're talking about the Canadian context, where there it's it's quite different in many ways, somewhat similar as well. But um, individuals who are making these claims have been very, they have failed. And these groups at being recognized by the courts, there's, I think I've, I've documented 150 different court cases in Eastern Canada, and they've all lost um, uh, by the governments, whether it's provincial governments or the federal government, none of them have been recognized in terms of these groups. And First Nations, which we call, which we call sort of tribes in Canada, have also opposed these organizations from the East Coast all the way to where I live in Eastern Ontario, which, where this movement is really based. But the success of this movement is individuals who are mobilizing their individual claims in public institutions. And so they are taking jobs that are reserved for um, Indigenous professors. Um, they're taking positions on councils that oversee uh, Indigenous uh, curriculum. Um, they're uh, running Indigenous arts funding organizations. Uh, all of these different public institutions have failed in actually um, living up to their promises when it comes to recognizing um, Indigenous sovereignty and self-determination, their policy has been self-identification. Self-identification is a major failure when it comes to um, Indigenous identity. And so I think our public institutions need to um, take a step back and really consider who they're recognizing as Native American in this context. Um, and that somewhat related to the situation in Vermont, but again, because these groups are state recognized, it's a different level of recognition. So it's very hard for people who work at public institutions to see one of these cards and say, well, I don't believe you, or you're not real, or whatever you might say. And so I think that that's why I think it really does come down to trying to overturn or change um, the, the, the legislation that exists. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, one more question, and then um, we're going to have a, a closing. Um, are the U.S. Canadian governments and Canadian governments recognizing the issue of pretendianism, uh, the kinds of issues brought up here today? Are the U.S. and Canadian governments recognizing the importance of this issue of pretendianism and what we're talking about here today? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, one of the things that keeps coming out in the U.S. are these reports that, um, so you know how some um, government contracts are reserved for quote-unquote minorities, and sometimes that includes uh, Native American um, organizations or businesses. And uh, there was a, a story recently, there was a, a fake tribe in Alabama who over the course of the past decade has received $500 million in federal contracts. Um, there was another fake Cherokee tribe in Missouri that received 200 million, and there's actually a, a senator in the U.S. whose brother-in-law runs this corporation, um, a well-known senator. Um, in any case, so uh, that's one way in which these groups are actually enriching themselves, is they're um, presenting themselves as uh, quote-unquote minorities and accessing these contracts that are reserved for minority corporations or companies. Um, and that's something the government could change by actually recognizing that tribes get to decide who um, indigenous citizens or indigenous citizens are in the US and really make that central to what this policy that they have when it comes to these contracts. That's just one example I'm giving you. Um, and it's related to obviously money, but um, there are, I'm sure are many other examples we can discuss. So Pam, do you have anything to add to that or? Yeah, I, I would say that the Canadian government at least is now right in its face dealing with legislation that was supposed to recognize three Métis groups. And one of those Métis groups is pulled out in recognition that one of those groups at least is fake. And that's something that First Nations are there. There's litigation. So if they weren't caring about it before they're going to be caring about it now and i know just uh from my personal experience maybe not as a government whole but different government departments and different agencies are now reaching out to indigenous experts saying okay come talk to our hr people 
come talk to our uh, staff, come talk, help us find ways to make sure that we're not promoting this inside the government because it's also rampant inside uh, governments as well. Good. Uh, Ogema Obamsawin wants to say a few words here. I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you all for coming out. And please remember, although Vermont is our ancestral territory and the remains of our families lie here, we have left this land in the hands of, you, of the good people of Vermont to take care of and to watch over, not to become us, not to take over our history, but we left it in your hands for good care and we trust you with it. The argument that we have with the state in changing legislation, the only part I don't understand with these tribes that stand up is that if they are truly who they are, why are they afraid of recognition with true identity? Why are they afraid for the governor and the state to put regulations in place? They shouldn't be afraid of it. They should be standing behind the people of Odenak. Again, I'd like to thank you all for coming out today. Only on yeah.